Villagers fight for removal of offensive sign in their neighborhood. Supervisors want the villagers to ensure homes being sold are deed compliant. SWAT team moves in on kidnapping suspect holed up in a villager's home. Villager claims her son wants to kill her and sell her house. Villa residents are unhappy about outsiders recreational vehicle hogging up guest parking. Fearful villager worried about their safety after an alleged attack by her neighbor's son. The developer is ready to hand off enforcement of rules against children and businesses. Walmart, will you ever learn? A villager who violated a no contact order arrested after trying to flee from a deputy. Golf Division seeks $4.56 million for course improvement projects. Community Watch will be patrolling 78,864 homes daily by October. Unresponsive man found in vehicle blocking traffic on the historic side of the villages. How many holes of ones of golf did we get this week? Letters to the editor. This and more coming up. Are you planning on having your driveway redone, having your garage floor epoxied, having a custom design in mind? Call B&D Concrete Creations. If you are new to the villages, B&D is the one I used and many others has also. Every driveway you see here is a custom design. Any type of design you'd like, you pick out the colors, he'll do it. Romaldo is very reliable and very dependable. He's got a crew of guys that respects your property and they won't cause any damage whatsoever. Have any questions? Call Romaldo. Free estimates. He'll leave the catalog. If you don't know what you want, have no idea about a design, he'll leave the catalog and you can keep it for a couple of days. Go through it. Look at the designs. If you see one or two in there that, that looks like it fits your bill, you can even tweak it. So just call Romaldo. Make the appointment he'll come meet you he's a really nice guy to talk to he's really busy but of all the people that i have ramaldo is the one that i can recommend give him a call let him come out let him talk to you show him what you want he'll work with you he'll, he'll do you a good job and his prices are reasonable and fair tell him i sent you that's b and d concrete creations llc Beautiful design driveways, walkway, pool decks, patios, garage epoxy, and much, much more. He's licensed and insured. Call Romaldo Mawire, 352-455-9614. Or you can go to his website, bndconcretecreations.com. Give him a call. He's good people. Hello, uh, my name is Romaldo. The company's name is BND Concrete Creations, LLC. You call me, uh, my phone number is 352-455-96. Any times, free estimate. Let's have some more news. Okay, this is an update to the kidnapping case that we had here. I did a special report on that when it first came out. I didn't update it because it was happening so quick that I felt like everybody probably saw the reports that came out through Sumter County news and places like that. And so I just didn't really give an update on it, but I'm going to give it an update now. So the SWAT team moved in on a kidnapping suspect holed up Friday evening in a home in the village of James Savage, who was believed to be barricaded in a home on the Bellhaven Loop in the village of Chatham. When the SWAT team from the Marion County Sheriff's Office aggressively closed in on him, crowds of neighbors who had been displaced from their homes were watching the standoff, which had continued for several hours. Negotiators repeatedly asked Savage to walk out of the home. They were communicating with him by phone and shouting to him. When the 54-year-old wouldn't budge, an armored vehicle moved in and smashed the window. A standoff continued into the wee hours Saturday morning. The Wildwood Police Department earlier in the day issued a bulletin for Savage after he was allegedly forced a revel done into Mercedes and drove away from the home in the village of Monarch Grove. They had been visiting another family. Wildwood Police Chief Randy Palmer said Dunn did not want to leave with Savage and he grabbed her by the hair, pushed him to the ground and struck her several times in the face. You guys saw that video. I posted it. Savage forced her into Mercedes and fled the area. Palmer said Savage and Dunn apparently had a long time romantic relationship. Mercedes was later found in Marion County section of the villages. It has been impounded. Dunn was also found by Marion Sheriff's deputies and she is said to be safe. And like the movie said, ma'am, run Forrest, run.
Tear gas was used to finally subdue a kidnapping suspect after a nearly 24-hour standoff in a home in the villages. A hazardous cleanup team from Marion County Fire and Rescue and a crime scene technician from the Marion County Sheriff's Office were sifting through the debris following the surrender of 54-year-old James Savage at a home in Bellhaven Loop in the village of Chatham. Neighbors who watched the standoff, which began Friday morning and finally ended at about 10.30 a.m. Saturday with Savage's surrender, said that a large large amount of tear gas was used by the SWAT team and a lingering odor was strong. An armored vehicle had been used to punch holes in the front door, garage, and some windows. The tactical forklift was used to rip out the garage door after it had been penetrated by the armored vehicle. A forensic unit van showed up Saturday afternoon and a technician appeared to remove the evidence. Fire Rescue Special Operations Unit, tasked with handling hazardous materials, arrived a short time later. The crew members donned protective gear when they entered the heavily damaged home. Savage was hardly a stranger to Bellhaven Loop neighborhood. He was arrested last year after alarming behavior, apparently fueled by jealousy, aimed at a woman who lived on the street. He sent her more than 200 text messages, many of them of a threatening nature. He also screamed into her ring doorbell camera on a number of occasions, leaving plenty of evidence of a scary behavior. Prosecutor's office opted not to move forward with the case after the victim became uncooperative. It's not clear if it is the same woman who was kidnapped Thursday in the village of Monarch Grove, prompting a bulletin from the Wildwood Police Department. That woman was later found safe. Savage is facing numerous charges in Marion County, including aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer, possession of a weapons or ammunition by a convicted felon, resisting arrest, and criminal damage to property. It was being held without bond at the Marion County Jail. Other charges are likely in Sumter County. And the thing is, now that's people here that are totally innocent where he decided he's going to hide in their house. The house stinks of tear gas. It ain't just going to come out. Carpeting, walls, furniture, all of it. The garage door's tore up. That needs replaced. Front door's tore up. That needs replaced. A window's ripped out. That'll need replaced. And who knows what other damage is done in this home? I don't know. I'm dumb about this. Will home insurance pay for that? Does the police department pay for that? The man that caused all this trouble, has he got to pay for that? Somebody tell me, because I'm at a loss here, who has to pay for these damages at these innocent people's home? Here's another update on what I think is turning into a very interesting case. But we've always heard about the lady getting ready to go to jail. She's being fined. She's not following her deed restrictions. Neighbors complaining about her son that's hoarding in there and all this and that. She goes to a district meeting about her deed compliance case. And she tells an interesting story here that I'll tell you what, it'll kind of put you on the fence. It'll make you think, is she right? Is she wrong? Is she just saying this to kind of protect her? I don't know. Stranger things has happened. Listen to this. A villager has told officials that her adult son wants to kill her and sell her house. Barbara Packard, looking thin, frail, and relying on a cane, shared terrifying details of the life she has been leading as a prisoner in her own home on Blythewood Loop in the village of Sunset Point. She spoke out Friday before the Community Development District 5 Board of Supervisors at Seabreeze Recreation Center. Packard's son, 37-year-old Jeffrey Packard, was arrested Monday after his mother called 911. He repeatedly had been draining his mother's bank account to buy drugs. He's after me. He wants to kill me. I'm scared, she said. I have been locked in my house for two years. She alleged that after her son has killed her, he hopes to sell the house and go to South America. The Packard home has been at the center of a long-running deed compliance case thanks to Jeffrey Packard for hoarding. Barbara Packard, the sole owner, is facing nearly $50,000 in deed compliance fines. She claims her son has set her phone so she can only call 911. She said he programmed the television so it only shows the History Channel. And he has allegedly locked his mother out of her bank account. She said she has been unable to refill her prescriptions due to lack of money. Officials indicated the Florida Department of Children and Families now step in and is involved in Barbara Packard's case. Her son was bailed out of jail. Oh my God, <laughs> who the hell would bail him out? You don't think she did, do you? Her son was bailed out of jail at about 7 p.m. Thursday, but has been ordered to stay away from his mother's home. The official reason the Packard problem was on Friday's CDD's 5 agenda was because of a new deed compliance case involving dead grass. Jeffrey Packard reportedly ripped out the irrigation system and the grass subsequently died. How would he rip out the irrigation system?
There's no money in that. Neighbors who attended the meeting said they were willing to lend a helping hand and help Barbara Packer start putting the pieces of her life back together. It's encouraging that the neighbors are willing to step up and help out, even after all they've been through, said CDD5 board chairman Gary Cadow. Wow. Weird, huh? Community Development District 7 Board of Supervisors are continuing to insist that the villages ensure that the homes being sold are deed compliant. It's something that should be required at closing. Supervisor Dale Klinko has said at Thursday CDD 7 Board meeting at Seabreeze Recreation Center. Supervisors said they have witnessed too many cases in which villagers unknowingly purchased homes that were in violation of the deed restrictions. Homeowners subsequently have faced problems with out-of-compliance driveways, improper land landscaping, and shingles that are the wrong color. This is a problem across the villages, agreed Supervisor Ed Coleman. TDD7 supervisors have invited representatives of property of the villages to come to hear their concerns. However, executives with properties of the villages have not responded to the invitation from the CDD7 board. Did you really think they would? This is going to dig into the developer's pockets. That's not going to happen. CDD7 legal counsel Michael Eckert said a fee-based voluntary program might set standards that would provide reassurance to home buyers. CDD7 board chairman Jerry Vicente, who represents his board on the project-wide advisory committee, said he would raise the idea with PWAC. This whole thing sucks. Well, people are selling homes here, and they're all playing the ignorant game. Well, I didn't know. You know, that's what they're doing. Uh, and they may not have. People buy homes here, and right away, they think they can plant a tree anywhere. They think they need new shingles on a roof, so they just go pick out a color and say, put them on. It's my house. I'll get what I want. And that's not the way it works here. And you can get by with that until somebody makes a complaint, and then they check it out, and then they find out, yes, those are wrong color shingles. We had a neighbor back here in the back, brand new spanking house. Don't ask me why. A about this. I have no idea why. She got more money in cents. She decided she didn't like the shingles on the house. She wanted to rip all of them off. Brand new home. Wanted to rip them all off and put these other shingles on. And she called about it. And they said, no, you can't put that color on. They actually gave her a color palette. Said, you can put these color shingles on your house. Pick any of them out you want. And that's what she had to do. Question was, why would you want to rip the shingles off a brand new house? What? A villager in a golf cart was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence after leaving R.J. Gators. That would be Lake Sumter. Sumter County Sheriff's Departments responded Thursday evening in an area of Stillwater Trail and East Over Terrace to investigate a report of a possibly impaired driver in a golf cart. They found 77-year-old Virginia Jane Shivert of the village of Mallory Square who said she had been at Lake Sumter Landing listening to Irish music. She also said she had been drinking at R.J. Gators. She said she had a couple of drinks at the popular restaurant on the boardwalk. She also had a cup in the golf cart, and she identified the beverage as vodka and tonic. She struggled through field sobriety exercises and provided breast samples that registered 0.142 and 0.146 blood alcohol content. Hey, listen, if you're sharing the road with a car in your golf cart, you cannot have an open container. You can't have an open container in your car. You cannot have an open container in your golf cart. Same rules apply. She was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence. She was booked at the Septa County Detention Center and released after posting a $500 bond. Villa residents are unhappy about an outsider's camper hogging guest parking in their community. Residents of the La Trobe Villas in the village of Winterford spoke out Friday morning before the Community Development District 5 Board of Supervisors at Seabreeze Recreation Center. Community standards confirmed that the camper had been parked in the guest parking in the villas and the owners do not live in the La Trobe Villas. He is a resident of CDD5. Villa residents said the owner of the camper has been defiant and has refused to move the camper. One resident said the camper is rarely moved, but when it is, the owner uses his car to save his spot. Resident also noted that there are residents of the La Trobe Villas who own recreational vehicles but pay to park them at storage facilities. The lack of guest parking has discouraged homeowners from hosting guests due to the lack of available parking. They are asking that signs be put up to specifically designate guest parking. What good do you think that's going to do? But yes, RV parking is prohibited. You can park them in your driveway, in the driveway, not on the street, for up to 72 hours for loading and unloading purposes only. 
The rest of the time, they got to be stored somewhere. I got mine in a storage lot. That's where everybody takes them. Why this guy's doing this? He's just trying to save a buck, you know. I don't blame him trying to save a buck, but you've been caught. Especially if you don't even live in that neighborhood. What are you doing parking your car in somebody else's driveway? I mean, that's what it boils down to. Oh, here we go again. A fearful villager told police he is worried about his safety after an alleged attack by her neighbor's son. The alleged assault, 34-year-old Joshua Joseph Duffy Sedicino, who lives with his mother on Dyson Loop in the village of Deluna, continued to be held without bond this weekend at the Sumter County Detention Center. He is facing felony charges of burglary and battery. In February, Duffy Sedicino walked into the kitchen of the man's home punched him in the face, and then struck him in the chest and shoulder, according to the rest report. The man attempted to fight back, but was kicked in the leg by Duffy Sedicino. The man tried to push Duffy Sedicino out of his residence, but Duffy Sedicino fought back, and the pair began kicking and punching each other. Duffy Sedicino eventually fled, but vowed to kill the man if he called law enforcement. Duffy Sedicino's mother persuaded the neighbor not to press charges against her son, who had been sentenced in 2017 to jail time after attacking a man at the Chula Vista Recreation Center. She eventually told her neighbor her son was to receive mental health treatment. Enablers. Mom is nothing but an enabler. However, what Duffy Sedicino's mother later told her village of Deluna neighbor that her son was to be released from a facility and would be returning home, the man panicked and called the police. He said he wanted to pursue charges in the February attack. I don't blame him. Duffy Sedicino was also arrested in 2022 on trespassing charges and in 2023 on contempt charges. Mom needs to move him out. He's old enough to take care of himself, and if he's got psychological problems, mom is not capable of taking care of him. A developer has indicated he is ready to turn over to the Community Development District the enforcement of rules against children and businesses here in Florida's friendliest hometown. A representative of the developer recently met with legal counsel for Community Development District 4, which, which raised, raised the possibility of taking over the responsibility for internal deed restrictions. Currently, the developer is responsible for enforcement of internal deed restrictions at homes in the villages. That includes internal deed restrictions against children living in the homes and residents running businesses out of the homes. For years, residents have voiced displeasure with what with they what see they as lax enforcement of these two rules in particular. What enforcement? CDD supervisors were informed this past week of a recent conversation with a developer. Some of the supervisors expressed some hesitancy about taking on the responsibility. Will that mean our legal bills will go up? Asked CDD 6 Supervisor Linda Gresick. The answer is yes, said Gresick. Said she feared that would mean an increase in the assessments paid by residents. I guess it depends on how much they go up and are they really going to enforce the rules or are we just going to have more lip service? And who's going to enforce that rule? That's the question. You can't go down there and knock on a door and say, hey, they got to go. There's got to be a legal system here. A second woman living on the historic side of the villages has been charged in a series of skip scanning thefts at Walmart. God, Walmart, take a lesson. Michelle Reed, 46, is facing three counts of thefts following her arrest earlier this month by Marion County Sheriff's deputy. Reed was accompanied by a 45-year-old Nicole Danielle Marie Damati in November and December to the Walmart in Summerfield. The women, who both live at 1619 West Schwartz Boulevard, used the technique known as skip scanning in which barcodes of lower priced items are scanned in place of the higher priced items in the self checkout aisle reed was previously convicted in 2009 she remains free on a 1500 dollars bond a villager was arrested on a drunk driving charge after crashing her golf cart into a minivan. Wendy Rose Schmick, 56, of the village of Deluna, was driving a 2019 Yamaha golf cart at about 7 p.m. Thursday when she collided with a Toyota Sienna in the area of Bunsen Boulevard and Sarasota Street at Pinellas Plaza. The minivan sustained about $1,000 in damage. During the traffic crash investigation, an officer suspected a New Jersey native had been driven. Drinking. Schmick admitted that she had consumed four rum and cokes before getting into her golf cart and leaving Lake Sumter Landing. She agreed to take part in the field sobriety exercise, but noted she has a medical condition that affected her bones and her spine, making her unsteady. 
She said she would fall down if she attempted the exercise. She also said she takes multiple medications. See, this is what I'm saying. People here takes all kinds of prescription meds, which is legal, but half of them they take, it says on the bottle, which they never read, you're not supposed to drive, but they do it anyway. Schmick was transported to the UF Health, the village's hospital freestanding emergency room at Brownwood. After she was medically cleared, she provided two breast samples, both registered 0.115 blood alcohol content. The officer noted in the report that the breast samples were taken three hours after his initial contact with Schmidt. Who knows what they was at the time she had the accident. She was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence. She was booked at the Sumter County Detention Center on a $1,000 bond. A Michigan man was arrested on a drunk driving charge after leaving a popular night spot at Lake Sumter Landing. Thomas Mitchell Case, 32, was spotted walking with an older woman late Friday night when they got into a golf cart and headed south on Canal Street. She drove the golf cart into a parking lot near 2J's Deli and parked near a black Lincoln passenger car with Michigan license plates. He began to get into the vehicle when he was approached by a deputy. I was hoping you weren't driving, the deputy said. He admitted he had consumed four or five beers at City Fire. He identified the beer as Michelob Ultra. He was asked to rate his level of intoxication with a zero being sober and 10 being heavily intoxicated. He rated himself at four. Michelob Ultra. (laughs) That's not even beer. Two empty Michelob Ultra cans and one empty Mango White Claw can were found in the Lincoln. Case initially took part in the field sobriety exercises but refused to continue. He provided breast samples that registered 0.230 and 0.257 blood alcohol content. Case, who was apparently staying locally in the village of Winterfred, was arrested on a charge of driving under the influence. He was booked at the Sumter County Detention Center and released after posting a $500 bond. A driver with a revoked New York license was arrested after a traffic stop near Laurel Manor Recreation Center. Elvis Raphael Jorge, 35, who is living at Lakeside Landings in Oxford, was driving a gray Honda HRV at about 9 p.m. Friday when he ran a red light while turning from Belvedere Boulevard onto County Road 466. A traffic stop was initiated near Laurel Manor Recreation Center. The New York native said he has been living in Florida for about six months, but had not obtained a Florida driver's license. A check revealed Jorge's New York driver's license has been revoked. A search of the vehicle turned up a smoking pipe which tested positive for the presence of marijuana. Jorge was arrested on a charge of driving without a license and possession of drug equipment. He was booked at the Sumter County Detention Center and released after posting an $800 bond. A villager who violated a no-contact order was arrested after trying to flee from law enforcement. Ryan Elmer Braun, 56, was spotted driving a purple Dodge Challenger at about 6 p.m. Saturday in the village of Mallory Square, where he was arrested last year after an altercation with a woman. A warrant has been issued for Braun's arrest after he failed to appear in court in the domestic battery case. A deputy initiated a traffic stop of the Dodge Challenger, but Braun was evasive about his identity and claimed his name was Steve. A woman in a car with him was later determined to be the woman involved in last year's altercation, which led Braun's arrest. A judge had issued a no-contact order in the case. When a deputy figured out Braun's identity, the Illinois native attempted to flee on foot. The deputy gave chase, caught Braun by his right arm, and took him to the ground. A second deputy soon arrived on the scene, and Braun was placed in handcuffs. Braun was also found to have a suspended license. He was arrested on charges of contempt of court, driving while license suspended, providing false information to a law enforcement officer, and resisting arrest. He was booked without bond at the Sumter County Detention Center. Villagers are fighting for the removal of an offensive sign in their neighborhood. A sign which has displayed a variety of handwritten messages is regularly leaned against a golf cart in a driveway at the home of David Reichert at 2800 Daylily Run in the village of Duval. He and his wife have owned the home since 2012. His neighbor pleaded their case Thursday morning after a Community Development District 7 Board of Supervisors at Seabreeze Recreation Center. The neighbor said they previously approached Reichert and advised him they believed the sign was in violation of deed restrictions. They asked him to stop displaying the sign. He refused. 
The handwritten message on the signs definitely offer a political viewpoint, but the neighbors said that that is not what motivated them to appear before CDD7 board. We are not asking you to regulate content. We are asking you to regulate the sign. If this is allowed to continue, it could get out of hand. It makes the villages look bad, said Brian Brown, who also lives on Day Lily Run. Nancy Parker said she's tired of looking at the sign. It's displayed every day at the end of his driveway. CDD7's legal counsel, Michael Eckert, said the sign is in violation of the deed compliance rules. Essentially, they are using a golf cart as if they would use an easel in the driveway, Eckert said. The board agreed to dispatch community standards to order Reichert to remove the sign. Supervisor Ed Coleman said he fears Reichert will ignore the order and take the sign down for a day or two and then put it back up. My concerns is that it's going to be a recurring problem. CDD7 board, Jerry Vicente, said he is prepared to use all of the board's power to rectify the situation. If he doesn't remove the sign, then he could face fines, Vicente said. And what if he don't pay? Let's see what that sign says on a golf cart. Just out of curiosity, I haven't read these. Finally, some guts and some common sense. A tranny was booted from the, from I'm reading exactly what it says. A tranny was booted from the from the woman's professional golf tour for playing with non-conforming balls. <laughs> oh, come on. That's funny. <laughs> well, you thought they could is. An unresponsive man was arrested after he was found in a vehicle blocking traffic on the historic side of the villages. Travis Brian Grabowski, 26, of Altoona, was found at about 3 p.m. Sunday in a silver GMC pickup at the entrance to Wales Plaza at U.S. 27 to 441, according to the arrest report. His head was leaning on the door of the vehicle, which was blocking the intersection. An officer was able to rouse Grabowski and, during a pat-down, found a white substance that tested positive to fentanyl. Grabowski admitted he has been using the drug for about eight months due to a bad breakup. Well, that's a dumb excuse. Grabowski was arrested on a charge of drug possession. He was booked at the Lake County Jail on a $2,500 bond. Knowing what drugs will do to you, and we've all seen those pictures, ain't we? Why would somebody voluntarily say, I think I want to try it? I, I don't understand. Community Watch will be patrolling 78,864 homes daily by October. That equates to 18 patrol drivers per shift across 90 square miles, according to Community Chief Nehemiah Wolf. Each driver is responsible for patrolling an average of 4,381 homes. He presented facts and figures Tuesday morning to the Amenity Authority Committee during a budget workshop at Savannah Center. Community Watch is funded through amenity fees paid by residents. Wolf, a former district commander in the villages for the Sumter County Sheriff's Office, made the distinction that while law enforcement is looking for crime, Community Watch is doing much more. Our eyes are continually looking. That could include noticing a street light that isn't working or a garage door that is open. Making sure garage doors are closed at night at homes is a courtesy check. Wolf noted that the door between the garage and the home is a sensitive access point. Community watch drivers also perform pool and postal checks as well as check 516 doors at recreation centers every night to ensure they have been locked. And they do. I used to work alongside those guys, and I've talked with them. They have a lot they do, and he didn't even mention that for a small fee, and I think it's something like $5 a day, I think, that if you leave and you want a well check on somebody at a home, like your wife, you have to leave for a day or two, and your wife's at home, that for like $5, they will actually go to your home, knock on the door, call the house to have a what they call a well check, and if nobody answers the phone or answers the door, they won't go in. They can't legally. They'll call the sheriff they'll call you too so they do a lot community watch here is probably one of the best things going executive golf maintenance is seeking 4.56 million for course improvement projects in a northern section of the village the director of golf maintenance mitch Leninger, outlined his request during a budget workshop with the amenity authority committee on tuesday at savannah center the aac oversees amenities north of county road 466 the request comes at a time when residents have been howling over the conditions of the golf courses in Florida's friendliest hometown. 
Last week, officials admitted they had failed by allowing courses to deteriorate to a level frequently described as atrocious by residents who fund the courses with amenity fees. Leninger's request from the AEC includes $950,000 for the renovations of the Walnut Grove Executive Golf Course, which originally opened in 2001. Work at Walnut Grove would include new greens, tees, bunker, sand, regrassing, landscaping, and cart path repairs. Under the plan, the Della Vista Executive Golf Course will see $1 million in renovations that would include new greens, tees, a turf nursery green, regrassing, cart path repairs, landscaping, and coquina. I don't even know what that is. What is that? Let me tell me. Coquina. The Della Vista course opened in 1995. Leninger is also seeking $1.5 million for a golf maintenance building at the Mir Mesa Executive Golf Course. Currently, the contractor responsible for maintenance is leaving equipment out in the open. The building would also include offices and restrooms. His plan also calls for $160,000 to be spent on bunker sand projects at Hawks Bay Executive Golf Course, Saddlebrook Executive Golf Course, $100,000 for cart pack pressure washing, and other projects who support butterfly gardens and Audubon areas. I'm kind of perplexed about this outside company that's hired to take care of the golf courses, and they want to spend a few hundred thousand dollars to build a building to put his equipment in our building. You know, and instead of raising our fees over and over and over again, how about charging him rent to put his equipment in our building? All right, let's see how many holes and ones of golf we got this week. Well, what I see, I thought there was more than that. Looks like three. I'm going to have to double check on that. We'll see how it goes. Maggie Ellinger got her second hole-in-one at hole number six of the El Santiago Executive Golf Course. Her first lucky ace was on hole number four of the El Diablo Golf Course. Congratulations on your hole-in-one number two, Maggie Ellinger. A lucky snowbird got his third hole-in-one while golfing in the villages. David Suchla scored the lucky ace on Monday, March 11th, at the Calusa course at the Bell Glade Championship Golf Course. Suchla winters in the Cedar Key Villas in the village of Buttonwood. He bought the villa in 2013. Well, congratulations on your hole-in-one, David. A villager finally got her first hole-in-one after golfing for 16 years. Beth Keke of the village of Santiago scored the lucky ace on March 10th at hole number four at the El Diablo Executive Golf Course. She used a sand wedge from 73 yards. Well, congratulations on your first hole-in-one, Beth. It's always a thrill. I thought they had another one in here, and we did. Here we go. A village of Citrus Grove man got his first hole-in-one after 15 years of playing golf. Jim Agarara. Scored the lucky ace on March 13th at 198 yards at hole number two at the Saddlebrook Executive Golf Course. He was using a five wood. Well, congratulations on your hole in one, Jim. How about some letters to the editor? To the editor, I believe the complaint should be submitted by a name. This is where the committee can make sure the same complaint can't come several times by the same person. It ensures the committee tracks complaints, city neighbors, realtors. Many complaints come from personal disputes. Some are viable and some are not. In saying this, I suggest that the complaint goes to the homeowner anonymously. This will alleviate conflict between the two parties. That's sent in by Valerie Brown from the Keystone Villas. I don't care how they do the complaint system, but what I'm saying is the person you're complaining about does not need to know where the complaint came from. It eliminates problems. Second thing is the person making the complaint in whatever district they're making the complaint in by giving their name and phone numbers and things like that, whatever they require, they should prove that they live in the district that they're complaining in. There's no sense in anybody making a complaint on a district they don't even live in. That's just how I see it. To the editor, several responses regarding the condition of the golf courses suggested that they should just eliminate them. The whole concept that created the villages was based on golf, long before anyone thought about pickleball or platform tennis in this area. We golfers pay about $1,000 for priority and then about $55 every time we play. How much do the pickleballers, platform tennis, volleyball, or water polo participants pay? I think we pay plenty enough to request good playing conditions. Just saying. That's sent in by Dick Jones, Village of Pennycamp. 
He's exactly right. Those of you to come down here that are new, and when you suggest something that stupid to do away with golf, you obviously know nothing about the villages, how it started, and why it's even grown to the point that it is. It's all about the golf and other activities. But basically, golf cart community, golf. That's how it started. And that's where grandpa or great-grandpa by now, Harold, that's how he started this place. And I'll give the kids credit for credit's due. They stick with what Grandpa generally started. It's a family business, and the family is still here. To the editor, it is time for the villages and the villagers to take a stand on what flags we are allowed to display on our flagpoles. Anything goes, which is the current edict causes discord and friction among neighbors, home buyers, sellers, and friends. Today, while out showing friends our friendliest hometown, We saw a Confederate flag on a flagpole, a F. Biden flag, and a Biden sucks flag. Are these examples of the faces we want representing our homes? You may think whatever you choose, but to fly it underneath or in place of the American flag is wrong. It's time to make a stand on this subject. That's sent in by Karen Horif from the village of Bel Air. Well, Karen, when they were talking about allowing flagpoles to put in their yards and whatever, I made a statement then. I'm not in charge. I can't say yes or no to anything, really. I said, but people were demanding it. It wasn't the village's developer demanding it. It wasn't your supervisors demanding it. It was the residents of the villages that were demanding flagpoles to be able to fly a flag. And I said then, if you don't put restrictions on that flagpole, this is going to open up Pandora's box, or it could. What are you going to do if, let's say, a Nazi? I just use examples, extreme examples, probably. I said, what are you going to do if a Nazi moves next door to you and they want to fly a Nazi flag? Are you going to be upset with that? Because he could fly a flag. What are you going to do when they start flying political flags? And I had no idea that they would. I thought, what are you going to do if they do? You going to have you going to have a problem with that? What are you going to do if Mexican people start put flying Mexican flags and not the United States flag at all? What are you going to do if foreign people start flying all kinds of foreign flags here? Which I could see it coming. What are you going to do? Just a thought. You should have thought about that before you demanded the rules to be changed. Now you want to change them back. Well, guess what? The polls are there. Now you're talking about freedom of expression and taking it away from somebody. I'll just say good luck with that. Okay, I think that's going to be the news this week. It might have been a little bit long. I don't know. Uh, But there was a lot going on. I'll get it out there the best that I can. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Please become a Patreon member if you can. You can start in as little as $2 a month. I did away with the 99-cent YouTube membership. So for 2 bucks a month, go to Patreon. You can get everything and more than you got on the YouTube memberships. And you have access to the Discord 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Sue shares her recipes on there. Other people share their recipes on on Sue's page just on Discord. And then, of course, we get on there and we joke around a little bit. And we also talk about the villages that people's got questions and we try to answer them too whenever we can. But there's other people on there that can answer them for you also. It's a good chat place 24-7 and nobody's going to harass you. So with all that, thanks for watching. Be well. Stay safe. I'll see you on the other side. Don't leave your keys in the golf cart. This week's news is brought to you by my YouTube and Patreon members.